Well, a blessed uh, Mother's Day to every one of you. And I know not everybody here is a mother, especially you men are not mothers. But a blessed Mother's Day to you. And I want to just thank you. Let me say thank God for the females in our life. Moms, girls, women, maybe uh, some that will someday be moms, grandmas. I don't know if I left anybody out, but I want to say how much we appreciate you. You knock off the uh, very rough edges that some of us have. Yours truly certainly has. And if you don't think that I don't appreciate you, I want you to notice that I'm wearing a pink tie. <laughs> and it's hard for me to wear a pink tie. My wife basically told me I had to wear a pink tie. <laughs> and that's part of the knocking off of the rough edges that she provides at my house continually. But we do love you. Uh, it's the grace of God that, that he has given you to us men in one form or another, either as wives, mothers, our friends in Christ Jesus. We're so grateful for all of you. Now, everybody here probably thinks that your mom was the best mom. Well, that's not true because I had the best mom. And I've got the best mom living at my house, too. Oh. But even with that, there is a mom in God's Word that we're going to look at today as we study God's Word because God has given us a pattern, as it were, of what you men, that or young men that may still be looking for a wife, this is what you need to look for. And you girls or women that will someday be a mom or a wife, this is what you need to pattern yourself toward because God has spoken. Why did God place Proverbs 31 in his word? So we can know his evaluation of the best mom. That's it in a nutshell. And so it behooves us to look at it today, and I, I apologize for stepping on Randy's Proverbs study. Uh, he'll do a much better job when he gets here. But for now, because it is Mother's Day, uh, we're going to concentrate on, on Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, the same thing that was done in our reading this morning. Would you bow with me and let me ask the Lord's blessing on our time and study together, please. Father, we're so grateful. As has already been stated, we're so grateful for moms. We're so grateful for the, the women that you have brought into our lives. We thank you, Father, for how they provide something that us men could not possibly provide in every way. We thank you for their sacrifices, their giving of themselves, and all these things that we will look at in your precious word. And Father, we pray that you would move on each of our hearts, and even in this study, that we would each learn something from it, and that we would refocus our thinking of living for thee. For ultimately, that's what everyone that is in Christ Jesus needs to be doing, living for thee. Whatever thy hand finds to do, do it with all your might, says your precious word. Father, help me to speak your word today clearly. And Father, I pray that you'd give us all ears to hear. To the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, we think about moms and mom's day, and we think of the pinks and the flowers and uh, just because they're lovely creatures in every way. But you know, what we must also envision and understand is that we are living in a battlefield, whether we like it or not. And moms are living 
in a battlefield. Now, some of you moms think the battle is there every day at the home with the little toddlers and the kids or whatever age they are, and, it is, and indeed it is, because we're under a curse and the prince of this world is seeking whom he may destroy. And everything is going on from the ultimate that we see in our society of rejecting God's word and therefore God as our creator and denial of evil and denial of morals and even sexual identity is being destroyed while emphasizing instead humanism and uh, denial of really what is true religion with false religion and the destruction of biblical re uh, institutions because the battle lines have been drawn. And each of us are in the battle. And moms, and girls, young ladies, all of us are engaged in this battle. And perhaps even more practically, there are personal distractions that continually press upon us and cause our battlefield to be very personal. We have the whole issue of selfism making ourselves the center of the universe. All this continual talk of my rights and self-esteem and I deserve something. Uh, the focus on pleasures. All the mys and the mys and the mys and the mys. Then there's this whole business of superficial thinking that presses on us to be more concerned for gratification than for character. And the whole business of being part of the herd mentality of the religion, which it is, a political correctness rather than focusing on righteousness and truth. Spending our life for the immediate rather than for God. Desiring things more than desiring God and desiring to please God. Listening to the world and its trappings rather than listening to God through His Word. How do we overcome such pressure at every turn? And the pressure has intensified, it hasn't let up, and it will not let up. We can only overcome by being in Christ and following His Word, believing in Him and trusting in Him. Because these timeless trappings of Satan can only be combated, and when it refers to women and moms, by the godly woman. And I believe that's what we have described for us here in our study. You know that the Bible tells us that those that are in Christ Jesus will overcome the world. Well, we overcome the world when we follow him. And so I remind you, God graciously formed three institutions, the family, the government, and the church, and they were in that order. And they were all used to control the effects of sin. And all are so important. It's hard to live in a nation of poverty and chaos and injustice and crime and violence that is focused in the wrong direction against God. And it's hard to continue in a church that is not teaching truth, not edifying, not honoring the Lord. And it's hard to live in a family that is dysfunctional or not fulfilling the obligations that God has ordained in his precious word. Those three institutions are all important, but if there was one that was more important and it was the first one given back in Genesis chapter 2, it is the home. It is the home because the home is the last shield from sinful chaos that may take place in a nation and in a culture or even from the apostate church that fails to represent Christ correctly. These words that we have penned for us in Proverbs 31, the words of Lemuel, Lemuel under inspiration, 
are an acrostic. It was something that was to be sung. An acrostic means that every verse begins with the first with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It was supposed to be memorized and sung, and it was important to be ingrained in the hearts and minds and lives because of its importance into the culture through moms. And it shows us God's view of an excellent wife. Practically, and the kind of person each wife should seek to be. And the kind of wife that every man should seek to find and to pray for and help and support and push, as it were, by grace anyway, into that direction. Now, the qualities that are always given in God's Word are timeless. Our context has particulars related to the culture. For example, he talks about a spindle in verse 19. I don't think anyone here is still using a spindle. Probably not. But the concepts for godliness are timeless. They remain the same. Now beginning, let's look at verse 10. He says, An excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. The word excellent is the Hebrew word which means strength with efficiency. It's an unusual word. To illustrate the significance of this word, it is translated in different ways in the Old Testament in the New American Standard Bible. In one place it's translated strength, in another place it's translated as an army, so it gives you something of the power of that word. Another place it is translated by the word valiant. And another place it is, ca- is translated capable. Look back with me at Exodus. Exodus chapter 18, where this word is used to give us some understanding of what is being communicated here. Exodus 18, verse 21. Here is uh, Moses being counseled by Jethro about judges. Because Moses was trying to judge everybody in the land, he probably had two million people there and all their little quarrels and things that were going on. He couldn't do it. Not even Judge Judy could do that, right? And so they were going to select judges. And notice verse 21. Furthermore, you shall elect out of all the people able men who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain, and you shall place these over them as leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. That little word, able, is our same Hebrew word that is translated excellent. And you see there's a lot of punch in that word. It means a whole lot of, of power and a whole lot of emphasis. If someone is capable of being this special and unique person to judge Israel and the people and make God's judgments to them, that same application applies here to this excellent wife. And the idea of who can find has as its meaning that such a woman is scarce and rare. And you know, in our society, people are generally looking for the wrong things when they're looking for someone to share their life with, but that ought not to be so in the church. But there is more to this than just who can find as a rarity. It has its emphasis who can find on something to be sought, something to be attained. Such a woman is so scarce and rare that the emphasis is on that she is a target. What we have here is a target, a type of what God has given us, a pattern, as it were, and concepts of what God's view is of this person who is able and capable and the excellent wife. Now, the Bible is not do's and don'ts as such, even with the many commands that it has. 
But the Bible really, with all of this, paints a picture of Christ's likeness. I hope you see that. It's all about Christ. And even if we're studying the excellent wife, we're studying something of the appearance of Christ in this. Because there is no perfect mom or woman, even though some of you come pretty close. <laughs> but that does not mean ever that those in Jesus Christ should not seek God's revealed will. That's what we're all about. That's why Paul would talk about, I haven't attained, but I press on. I press on to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what every one of us are called to do. To be the ideal woman is not something, by the way, that you can grit your teeth and, and say, okay, make your resolutions tomorrow. I'm going to start being this ideal woman. I think that's a grand idea. But where do you turn? Philippians 2.12 tells us, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is God who works in us to will and work His good pleasure. It's always God's work as we seek Him, Lord, make me this. And it starts with a desire. And we have the pattern and we have the portrait and that's what it is here. This is something then to study and to learn, and not necessarily the details, as some have tried to do, because those change with the culture, but the attitude behind the, de the details. Because attaining to this is something, he says, that is far above jewels. To have this kind of wife, to be this kind of wife, to be this kind of young lady, to be this kind of person is so valuable, so important, it is measured by God as far more significant than all the riches of the world. Really, that's what it's saying. And for girls and young women and all women, it should be your goal to form yourself around the instruction that is found here and in the Word of God. Now, the world has another agenda. And that's what you're bombarded with all the time. And often it, that agenda even creeps into the church and takes us away from what God would have us to be. But here's something to emulate. Don't emulate Hollywood. Don't emulate all these people that are on the road to destruction. Don't emulate anybody that can take you away from Christ and get you off the path. But emulate this. Now, don't do it in your flesh. Do it prayerfully and clinging to Christ who can make you what you need to be and transform you what you need to be. Now, we will summarize these qualities into seven telling areas, and, of course, I had to use S's, so... I may be stretching some of them a little bit, but they're, they're close. And these qualities will never be perfected in this life, but what are they? They are a target by the grace of God to seek. That makes sense? Now, the first thing I listed here is that she is special. Now, we already talked about that, and special in many ways. We've talked about her being rare and valuable, but anyone, may I just say this, Anyone can be a conformist to humanism and all the isms that engulf the world in its thinking. But this woman here is different. Her godly character is rare and she is special as a, as because of that. Now that needs to be emphasized throughout all of this. The word excellent again has already been discussed, but it sets this person apart. It's a word which can only really be used of someone who knows God. Please get that as an, in your understanding. You can't be really special. You're just going to be one of the cookie-cutter people of the world until you come apart and God is more important to you than all the rest of the stuff. 
That's why we're told that we shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. God must be first. Anything else is really idolatry. So we follow Him. This is the only thing that can make anyone truly special. Would you turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This, I'm, I think, is not emphasized enough, perhaps. It's very practical, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Here's the Apostle Paul, and we use this when we're talking about marriage counseling in particular. Verse 14, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And he goes on to explain from there. And if you apply that to marriage, that's the whole idea that no believer should ever be married to an unbeliever. No Christian should seek or consider a marriage to a non-Christian. Now, some of us here present probably married before you were dealing with all of this, or maybe, maybe your spouse has gone a different direction since you were married, and you're hanging in there, and that's the appropriate thing to do from other instruction in the Word. And God bless you in what you're doing. That's not what we're talking about here, but what we are talking about, if you're in Jesus Christ today, you need to think seriously about what is the high priority of your life in relation to this. And then secondly, what this tells us is that in all of our relationships that are going on in the world, aside from Christianity, we need to be very careful in those relationships because there really is no union of light and darkness. That's what he's telling us here. And that's why our focus of attention is on what God says about everything in life. It's not just on Sunday when we go to church and we're religious for a time, but it's all the time. So this special speaks of a character with godly thinking and actions. And this is why we're going to get to the woman being praised when we get to the end of this. And if you'll look down in verse 30, if you're back in Proverbs 31, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be charming and have beauty. It's wonderful to see the whole package. But if you're comparing one thing with another, what is most important is a woman who fears the Lord. Who fears the Lord. This is the woman that has the greater than jewels value because she has a relation with Christ. And that term fears the Lord or fears God has to do with a reverence that puts God first. And it has to do, obviously, it, in, it is incorporated with trust in it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so it incorporates, in that sense, all that God's people should be in putting God first in their thinking and in their life and following after him in a faithful and trusting manner. And it has to do with the indication of true relation with God. And this is the key to any person's character. It's not just a matter of being religious. It's about relationship. And the true value of anyone is measured by that person's relationship to God. Think of that, please. Everything else is going to burn up. It really has no value. And that's why, again, because she's a new creation, that her, we get down to verse 31, her works will praise her in the gates because she is a new creation. And she is going to show the production of fruit, God's fruit, in her life. Now, the remainder of these qualities display that fruit and why she is different and why she is special. I'm going to run through these concepts very 
quickly. Look at verse 11. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. Rather than, uh, and this is her, she's steady, she's reliable, she's consistent, she's sure, like our Lord is. Rather than requiring continual oversight and often corrective or uh, what we see in families fussing and feuding about things, she is consistently a blessing. She can be relied upon to make wise decisions, whether at the grocery store <laughs> or at the dress shop. Husbands and wives often fuss and feud, don't they, over some of these things and over decisions small and large, and many families have split apart, sadly, based on not being able to trust one another. That's really what it boils down to in daily essential activities because these marriages or partners in life, they're going in all directions, but yet they have to be unified. Look at verse 12. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She is his steady, reliable companion, bringing continual good to him. This is a family unit together. There's no friction resulting from this lack of trust. This is a woman who always makes the best decisions on behalf of her God, on behalf of her husband, on behalf of her children. Look at verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. The benefits of her husband's welfare is known. Gates was the place of public discourse and judgment and leadership. And she adds credence here to the family name. She promotes and blesses his reputation because her reputation and all of her activities and all the fruit that she produces is just as gl glorious or more so than her husband's is. And it is in conformity to him and his will and the promotion of the family name. Look at verse 25. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. How does she promote her husband? Strength and dignity. Strength and dignity. And especially you think of that little word, dignity, which has to do with honor. She carries herself in an honorable fashion everywhere she goes. And this whole business of smiles at the future means that she is comfortable in her relationship with God and with her Husband, she's resting in God. She's at peace with God. She is not restless and, and, uh, and, and kind of doing her own thing as so many people are today. Even getting into gossip and this isn't right and that's not right and fussing and feuding about this and the other. She's work, walking in dignity. Notice verse 17. It says that she girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. In conjunction with her dignity, may I just simply say, this is all common sense, she takes care of herself. She makes her arms strong. I don't know what that means exactly. Maybe she's lifting weights. I don't think so. But the idea here is, is the concept that she's taking care of herself so that she can continue to function in her role. I think implied is that she is groomed, disciplined in body, an example to all of an ideal woman, a testimony to her husband, children, and everyone, and it aids in her capabilities to serve, as we shall see. Now, you have heard that to behind every good man is a good woman. I think there's a whole lot to be said for that. That's all about the compliment that men and women make, especially women that we were so needed that God created them for us. Uh, but the idea is that men, women can enhance our lives, complement our reputation. Frankly, some of us need to get pushed up a little bit, a whole bunch. And only our wives can do that or, on the other hand, many a good man has been brought down by his wife. Women 
can make us or break us in that regard. And this ideal one, you'll see, is a blessing to her husband. His reputation, I could truly say, as I can truly say of myself, I married over my head. And by the way, most of you <laughs> married over your head. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Now, not only is this woman steady, but she's serving. She's serving. She's diligent and hardworking. She's not the least lazy nor shy of activity. She's a doer. And she's repeatedly described in terms of diligence and strength. Look at verse 13. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. I love that. Now, again, this is the culture. What is she doing? She works with her hands, and it's an attitude. Because not only is she ready and willing, not uh, taking herself as somebody above this kind of thing, as so much is obviously true today, but it says that it is her delight. It's what she wants to do. She loves her busyness and her work on behalf of her family. Hallelujah. How, how wonderful is that? That someone that is content in what they're doing, and not only content, but is loving what they're doing because they see it as God's calling. Look at verse 15. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. Here's rising early and retiring late. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been raised in a house where my mother was the first one up, and used to be that I would smell bacon and eggs the first thing in the morning. Now, Jan and I try to cut back on the, on the intake of food, uh, but the first thing I smell every morning when I get up is because she's beat me to the punch is the coffee brewing in the kitchen. And it's wonderful to have this activity Around you, look at verse 18. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She is diligent all the time in what she is doing on behalf of her God ultimately and her family. Look at 27, the last part of that. It says, she looks well, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness that was the mindset that is seen throughout the scriptures we recently had the study in proverbs about consider the ant you sluggard nobody has to tell the ant to get with it and here is this godly woman doing that you you think in the new testament the apostle paul if you get over there to second thessalonians chapter three it says them that don't work don't eat <laughs> That's kind of amazing, isn't it? That's pretty, pretty much a far fetched to the mindset of the day that is, I'm just all about my leisure. I'm all about my idleness. I want laziness is sort of held up as a, as a manner of life that is really something to be attained to. Let somebody else do it or let somebody else take care of it for me or let somebody else take care of me. As if I'm owed something. Please don't have that mindset. This home is a home that is obviously neat and orderly. And it is a blessing. It's a blessing that requires hard work. And, and working like a well-oiled engine. Look at verse 21. She's not afraid of the snow for her household. Why is she not? Because, it's, because we look further there, she's prepared. For all her household are clothed with scarlet. Now, you don't wait till the snowstorm comes and then run around, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We don't have clothing for this. She's already prepared. Look at verse 25b. It says at the bottom of that, she smiles at the future. In other words, she's thinking uh, in advance of everything that needs to be done and meeting those requirements in every way. And she's working on them on behalf of her precious family. 
And then we move into sacrificial, very important for all of us. But when I think of sacrificial, I think naturally of moms and women that are working like this. We've already seen her dignity and her serving activity, but there's an el another element to this. Look at verse 27a. She looks well to the ways of her household. And what that's telling us is that her, uh, her focus is not primarily on herself, is it? She's not sitting all day in front of the mirror primping herself. That, I, I think some of that is, I'm happy for it. <laughs> I am. But that's not her focus. Her household is her focus. And, and what this tells us is that the lines of communication are open. She knows what's going on with every person in her house, every child, their concerns, their needs, their corrections, their needed instruction. What is she? She's actively engaged, in other words, and sacrificial in the sense that self is on the back seat here. She's working sacrificially on behalf of her husband and her children. And we could put it another way. This is humility, isn't it? Humility is putting others before ourself. And in other words, her household activity and is not hindered by her personal comfort. She puts that aside. I've seen that over and over with my wife, with my mother, when we were sick, and she was so sick that she could hardly walk, but she's still taking care of us. My dear friend, that's sacrificial. That's serving sacrificially. Look at Matthew chapter 20 at the words of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 20. Here is this attitude that Christ is looking for. Look at verse 25 of, of Matthew 20. Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them, over the people. They like to lord over. There's a bunch of people in our society that want to lord it over everybody. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. What did Christ do? He washed the feet of his disciples. He went to the cross on behalf of their sin. And he says that whoever wishes to be the first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, all of this, all of this stuff that we are studying has to do with Christ's likeness, doesn't it? And as you as a woman are doing the things that are prescribed or shown here in these concepts and in this portrait that is being painted, you are serving Christ because you are serving as Christ served with the same attitude and the same mindset. And I know that some of you of necessity have to work outside the home and I could just say I think that's fine and that can be done sacrificially as well it's of necessity some are single parents that their only means of support of their children or child is to work outside the home and they do the best they can to make up for it when they are at home but never do it for selfish reasons or to be a detriment to your household but do it if it is essential that is sacrificial the next quality that we see is I've called sagacious that is they act in wisdom look at verse 26 and verse a, the first part of that she opens her mouth in wisdom 
We have stated her dignity. Her speech is her key testimony. Wisdom is her hallmark. Wisdom honors God, for he is the source. And may I say that by the whole idea of opening your mouth in wisdom, and you cannot open your mouth in wisdom unless you are walking with God, unless you know your God, unless you are filled with, with his Holy Spirit guiding you, can you open your mouth in wisdom? Otherwise, you're going to open your mouth in foolishness. How many times have you been at a restaurant or the grocery store or somewhere and you see a bunch of carrying on with children that is just bizarre because there's carping and yelling and threatening and all manner of things. I've heard profanity and everything under the sun in relation to children because the opening of the mouth is not in wisdom, not in grace, but in something far different. She uses this wisdom in other ways. If you look back at 18 and verse A, it says she senses that her gain is good. And down in verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. In her wisdom, she even uses her skills to benefit her family. She's crafty. She's industrious. She brings a return to the family. She has the ability to engineer quality goods for the benefit of others and to enhance the bank account of the family. That's what it's really saying, i.e., she's a giver. She's a giver in every way of herself and even beyond. And look at verse 16. It says she considers a field and buys it from her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She invests the money wisely, even from her own earnings. She's a person saving and managing the assets of the home in wisdom. And then look back at verse 14. She's like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She goes to great lengths for the best bargains. That's what that's saying. She shops well. It's related back to number one, where she's reliable and trustworthy and consistent. She doesn't spend the household money foolishly, but wisely. Now, many a spouse, and that can go in either direction, the man or the wife, has bankrupted the family by spending foolishly. I've just got to have this, or I've just got to have that, demanding impractical things to the detriment of the whole family. But this woman, you see, acts wisely, sacrificially, as we've already seen, on behalf of the family in every decision and can be trusted in those decision, decisions because she is living wisely, practically, and has God's continuous wisdom because of the obvious grace of God in her life. Now, she's also selfless. And that word really is a word that also means or can mean generous, not consumed only with herself or even only her own as most in the world are, but in all her responsibilities and activities, she remembers those in need. Look at verse 20. She extends her hand to the poor and she stretches out her hands to the needy. Extends and stretches shows personal involvement, willingness, concern, giving of herself personally, Ministering to others shows the work of God. A Christ-like heart, it would fit in well with the good Samaritan. That when God places people with real needs in our path, that we might have a gracious heart ready and able to help in that need. That is the work of God, a Christ-like heart. And then finally, the last one here I put was superb, because all of this is kind of summed up in this. Superb, gracious. Her abilities of grace cannot be measured. She is seen, as we've said, first in control and, and the content, the discretion of her tongue. Uh, we saw back in 26a the teaching of this woman is called the teaching of kindness. 
for conversation is a blessing. Just for a moment, look back over at Proverbs, since we're close by. Proverbs 25, verse 11. This is one of my favorite Proverbs. And too, too often my tongue is not fitting this, but this is the goal. Proverbs 25, 11, like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstance. Think how precious and beautiful that is. Like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstance. That should be the tongue of the people of God. And this is the superb thing I'm talking about. This is the gracious thing that I'm talking about. This is gracious talk, edifying talk. And it, I believe it's because she spends time with her Lord. Back in her context in 18b, it says her lamp does not go out at night. She has spent time with her Lord. It tells us in verse 30, of course, again, that she fears the Lord. And because she's walking with her God, what is in her heart and comes out of her mouth is consistently edifying and a blessing to others like these apples of gold and settings of silver. And it's humorous, but not humorous. Look back at Proverbs 21 and verse 9. Here is this statement by Solomon. It is better to live in a corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Like I said, it's funny, but not funny. And in that day, the roof was a place that you could gather. It was up on the roof because you get, get air, fresh air. And here's somebody that is dwelling in the corner of the roof outside in the elements, the furthest they could possibly get from anything else and anyone else in the house. That's not a pretty picture, is it? Paul used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 the picture of a nursing mother in talking about the grace of God. He says, we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children because that really is the standard of God when we get in relationship with one another. Our mouths should be the mouths of the living God that is always gracious and needs to permeate our households. There needs to be no whining and fussing, harping, carping, whatever you want to call it. That characterizes most or many homes, I think most homes, where there's this type of continual battlefield. Instead, our tongue graces peace in the home, the peace of Christ that passes all understanding. And so we see that this woman is prepared for the battlefield of life. And her battlefield is the home. And there's a portrait. It is our target, if you want to call it that. There's much more that could be said here. But she is a complete woman. And it's no wonder when we get down to verses 28 and 29, her children rise up and praise her. Now, that's consistent with God praising her too, right? But there's no greater blessing in life than when our children praise us, not because we're anything, but because they see the grace of God in our life. Now, I started in closing, I want to say that with that behind many who love God is a godly mother or behind every good man is a God fearing mother. There's a quote in the bulletin from John Wesley that he says that he learned more from his mother than he did all the theologians in England, and there were a bunch of them at the time of Wesley. But it was also so with Moses, with Samuel, with Timothy, with Augustine, with Spurgeon, with G. Campbell Morgan, and on and on the list could go on. But I want to read this to you in closing. And I copied it from a book addressing the great preacher, DeWitt Talmadge. And I read the following to you. Listen carefully, please. When David Talmadge, the father of the famous preacher, DeWitt Talmadge, was an 18-year-old boy still living at home with his brother Jacob and his sister, 
One night, the three of them were determined to go to a questionable party. Their mother, who was an invalid, called them to her bedside just before they left and said, I know you're going out to a party, but I want you to know that I shall be on my knees praying for you until you return. They went, and on their return, they passed their mother's door at 2 a.m. in the morning, catching a glimpse of her still, still kneeling by her bed. Early the next morning, the mother wakened her husband and asked him to get up and see what was the matter, for she heard someone weeping. Going hastily down to the living room, the father found his daughter on her knees weeping, but when he undertook to speak to her, she said to him, Father, go to the barn, for David is in worse need of you than I am. I shall be all right. Going to the barn, the old gentleman found David weeping his heart out, for mighty conviction had seized him. However, when Mr. Talmadge had prayed a short time with him, David said, Go to Jacob. He needs you more than I do. I believe he's in the wagon shed. And so it turned out that the Lord saved all three of the Talmadge children that morning in answer to the determined and definite praying and example of their mother. Moms, you make a big impact. I think bigger than anybody. I think you make the biggest impact. You're so vital. And you're in a battlefield. And God has shown us, not just here, but all over his word, how to fight the battle by the grace of God to point our children to Jesus Christ. And I thank you, mothers. And I exhort you to contend for the faith, to trust God, to submit to him, and to be, by God's grace, to be an excellent woman, as has been even shown to us here, so that you will indeed hear the praise of your family, but whether you do or not, someday you'll hear the praise from your Father in heaven. He says, well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father, we thank you for moms again and for the, all the women in our lives and our girls, how precious they are. Oh, Father, impact in their minds the importance of knowing thee and walking with thee and doing thy will, which could never, ever be wrong. It's always right in every circumstance. Help them, I pray thee, Father. And thank you again and for the blessing they are and help us all, Father, even to follow the same pattern that we might walk with thee and know thee, all of us. To the praise of Jesus Christ we pray, amen.